Hello everyone, this is Jill bringing you a new episode of the Compendium podcast series. Here from our home base, high in the magnificent Himalayas in North India, the Little Family team extends a very warm welcome to our homeopathic listeners all over the world. In these podcasts, you can listen to short readings on important themes and interesting topics taken from the six volumes of the Homeopathic Compendium by David Little. You can enjoy fascinating glimpses into the history, philosophy and practice of classical homeopathy. In our last episode, we discussed the central principles of dynamism or vitalism in homeopathy. This leads us to a closer investigation of the vital force and the way it functions. In the Organon, Hahnemann presented a complete action-reaction model which explains how the vital force responds to similar and contrary stimuli. In homeopathic treatment, the vital force responds to the primary action of a similar remedy with a secondary curative action. This is Compendium Talks, Episode 7, The Vital Force, The Action-Reaction Model. The reading is from Volume 1, Chapter 14, Hahnemann's Biomedical Model. I will start with a paragraph called Seven Steps to Cure and then move on to a discussion of Steps 4 and 5 which concern primary and secondary reactions of the vital force. Seven Steps to Cure The preface, introduction and aphorisms of the Organon make up the complete guidebook to homeopathy. In the introduction, the founder wrote a detailed explanation of homeopathic cure in seven italicized points. This review of the seven points of cure include the author's commentary based on the Organon, the chronic diseases, the Paris case books, Hahnemann's personal letters and eyewitness accounts. The founder's seven points of homeopathic cure are as follows. Point one, true medical art is that cogitative pursuit which devolves upon the higher human spirit, free deliberation and the selecting intellect which decides according to well-founded reasons. Point two, it does so in order to differently tune the instinctual intellect and awareness lacking automatic and energetic life force when the life force has been mistuned through disease to abnormal activity. Point three, it differently tunes the life force by means of an affection similar to that of the disease engendered by a medicine that has been homeopathically selected. Point four, by means of this medicine, the life force is rendered medicinally sick to such a degree, in fact to a somewhat higher degree, that the natural affection can no longer work on the life force. Point five. In this way, the life force becomes rid of the natural disease, remaining occupied solely with the so similar, somewhat stronger, medicinal disease affection against which the life force now directs its whole energy and which it soon overcomes. Point six. The life force thereby becomes free and able again to return to the norm of health and to its actual intended purpose, that of enlivening and sustaining the healthy organism. Point seven. It can do this without having suffered painful or debilitating attacks by this transformation." Unquote. The remedy replaces the natural disease, primary action. We will now repeat point four. By means of this medicine, the life force is rendered medicinally sick to such a degree, in fact, to a somewhat higher degree, that the natural affection can no longer work on the life force." Unquote. The curative power of a homeopathic remedy is based on similarity and the superior power of the potentized remedy. 
See aphorisms 12 to 27. A chronic disease lasts lifelong because it cannot be removed by the vital force. The homeopathic remedy replaces the natural disease with a temporary medicinal disease which ends with the cessation of the medicine. The substitution of a transitory medicinal disease for a permanent natural disease is at the root of healing with similar remedies. In aphorism 29 of the Organon, Hanuman wrote, 1. Any disease, which is not strictly a surgical case, consists solely of a specific dynamic disease mistunement of our life force, life principle, in our feelings and functions. 2. The life principle, which has been dynamically mistuned by the natural disease, is seized during homeopathic cure by the similar, yet somewhat stronger, artificial disease affection which results from the application of the medicinal potence selected exactly according to symptom similarity. 3. The feeling of the natural, weaker, dynamic disease affection is extinguished and disappears for the life principle and from then on no longer exists for the life principle which is occupied solely by the stronger artificial disease affection. 4. The artificial disease affection soon plays itself out, leaving the patient free and recuperated. The dynamis, thus freed, can now continue life again in health." Unquote. The homeopathic remedy overtunes, that's German Uberstimmen, the natural disease and in the process removes the sensation of the natural disease in the life force. Now the organism only suffers from a subtle, temporary, medicinal disease which the vital force can easily overcome. This aspect of cure is explained in the footnote to aphorism 29. Hanuman wrote, The short duration of the action of the artificial morbific potencies which we call medicines, makes it possible for them, even though they are presently stronger than the natural disease, to be far more easily overcome by the life force than are the weaker natural diseases, which, solely on account of the longer, mostly lifelong effective duration, e.g. sora, syphilis, psychosis, can never be vanquished and extinguished by the life force alone. Unquote. In aphorism 30 through 70, Hanuman explains the nature of susceptibility, aphorism 31, dissimilar diseases, aphorisms 35 to 42, similar diseases, aphorism 49, the superiority of homeopathic remedies, aphorisms 50 to 61, and the primary action of medicines and the secondary action of the vital force, aphorism 62 to 70. The organism is affected more easily by the power of remedies than by natural disease because a homeopath can control the nature of the medicinal disease, the amount of the dose, the degree of potency and the duration of the remedy. In this way, natural diseases are conditional whereas homeopathic remedies have superior power to heal. The action-reaction model, secondary curative action. Point five, in this way, the life force becomes rid of the natural disease, remaining occupied solely with the so similar, somewhat stronger medicinal disease affection against which the life force now directs its whole energy and which it soon overcomes." Unquote. The disease-tuned vital force is no match for a chronic disease without a homeopathic remedy. Once the remedy replaces the sensation of the natural disease, the life force seeks to remove the external medicinal disorder 
with its internal curative secondary action. During this process, the life force directs its whole energy to remove the external remedy mistunement and return to the state of health. In the preface of the Paris edition of the Chronic, Disease, Chronic Diseases, Hahnemann elucidates the primary action of the remedy and the secondary action of the vital force in great detail. This model explains the role of the vital energy in the process of cure and clarifies how the secondary curative action takes place in stages. This explanation offers a glimpse of how a medicinal solution administered in split doses of gradually ascending potencies returns the organism to health. In the chronic diseases, Hahnemann wrote, but if we physicians are able to present and oppose to the instinctive vital force, its morbific energy, as it were magnified through the action of the homeopathic medicines, even if it should be enlarged every time only by a little, if in this way the image of the morbific foe be magnified to the apprehension of the vital force through homeopathic medicines, which in a delusive manner simulate the original disease, we gradually cause and compel the instinctive vital force to increase its energy in degrees and to increase them more and more, and at last to such a degree that it becomes far more powerful than the original disease." Unquote. The natural disease deranges the vital force in such a manner that it cannot tell self, the esse, from other, the natural disease, and takes part in damaging the organism. If the healing artist is able to present and oppose the instinctive vital force with the primary action of the remedy, it will replace the natural disease with a stronger but temporary medicinal disease. This is why a patient suffering from a disease characterized by tightness and cold should be given a potentized remedy that is characterized by tightness and cold. In this way, the image of the natural disease is magnified to the apprehension of the vital force in a delusive manner. The primary action of the remedy is a form of information transfer that allows the vital force to perceive the disease as separate from self. This causes the secondary curative action of the vital force to increase its energy in degrees until it becomes far more powerful than the original disease. An increase in vitality is one of the signs that a remedy is well chosen. In the process, the tightness and cold associated with the diseased state is overcome by the relaxation and warmth of the healthy organism with restored vitality. Once the vital force is completely free from the natural and medicinal disease, it returns to enlivening and sustaining the healthy organism. When a patient who is tight and cold is given a relaxing and hot remedy, the symptoms will be momentarily suppressed, but in time the counteraction of the vital force will produce even more tightness and cold. If the suppressive medicines are continued, they may cause the mutation of the symptoms inward to more important organs and systems. The centripetal movement is in the opposite direction of the centrifugal movement of the law of cure. This is the essence of Hahnemann's action-reaction model, which explains how the vital force responds to similar and contrary medicines. Constantine Herring was of the opinion that some parties did not understand how homeopathic remedies cure. They were putting all the emphasis on similarities and forgetting the role of the curative counteraction of the vital force. Even today, some claim that the vital force plays no significant role in the healing process. They believe that attributing any curative power to the opposing counteraction of the life force is contrary to the law of similars. This, however, is a misunderstanding of how the primary action of the similar remedy and the secondary action of the vital force interact. Herring wrote, I had different views about the similarity of the symptoms 
and believe that it always was an action in the opposite direction of the medicines that affected the cure, but that the similarity of the symptoms pointed out the best and surest antidote to the disease. Just as one motion can only be arrested or annulled by another exactly similar one, but in the opposite direction, as we see in the motion of wave, sound, light, just so, I thought, it must be the motions of life. Unquote. Hanuman pointed out in his Seven Steps to Cure in the introduction an aphorism 63 and 64 of the Organon that the cure by dynamic remedies is based on the interplay between the primary action of the medicine and the secondary action of the vital force. The primary action of the similar remedy replaces the sensation of the natural disease on the vital force. The curative secondary action of the vital force then seeks to differentiate its energy from the external influence by removing the medicinal disorder from within to without. This process is the basis of the action-reaction model. That's the end of our reading for today. I hope you found it interesting. Don't forget to watch out for our next podcast. Bye-bye. See you again soon.